had to keep knocking me, you know, waking me up. But anyway, hopefully uh, things are going to be smooth sailing this evening because I have an awful lot that I want to share with you. So um, I think we'll go ahead and get going. And if anybody else cares to join, I've got it set so they can come on in. So let's uh, let's see what we've got going here for this evening. So this image is going to haunt me forever. This is what I saw for a good part of uh, yesterday evening, uh, as well as uh, part of this morning. Um, we're going to make that go away because we can. We'll get our uh, get our program. <laughs> Creatures that have the wonderful quality of biofluorescence. If, if you've been uh, tuning in to Good Natured uh, over these past several weeks, you know that this has been a really popular topic. If you're new to us this evening, um, you'll find out this is something we, we visit frequently. There's a lot of uh, interest right now in the scientific community uh, about animals that uh, appear different colors under uh, different spectrums of life, uh, light, um, particular um, everyday creatures with black light and finding out they have special qualities. Um, the, uh, the flying squirrels, yeah, even the kinds that we have here in Illinois, fluoresce bright pink. Um, there's uh, people who work in wildlife rehab who are now using black lights to shine on um, birds of prey, particularly owls, to age their feathers and uh, figure out how old uh, of an animal that they're dealing with. Um, there's all kinds of animals in Australia that have biofluorescence. Uh, um, but so you know, we've talked about this over and over again. So, um, you know what, we're, we're gonna actually skip that topic uh, tonight. Uh, I did write about it, uh, so you can check out that article last week. Um, and I'm sure we'll be visiting this in the future. In fact, I'm actually looking at a, uh, an upgrade to the black light that I have so I can go out and um, see what our amphibians are up to, um, not just in their springtime activities, but also in the colors that they fluoresce. So um, for tonight, we're gonna skip that and move on to something else that's very seasonal right now. Um, American woodcocks, they're back. Um, I heard one uh, night before last uh, if you're not familiar with this animal, they are, uh, they're a funny little bird. They're actually um, uh, classified as a shorebird, uh, but they don't spend a lot of time uh, uh, near shores. Uh, they, in this area, favor uh, wet areas, marshy areas. They're uh, in the same family as these guys here. Uh, this is a snipe. Um, in this area, we have the Wilson snipe. Um, I actually saw my first snipe uh, exactly one year ago. It was in March of um, 2020, and I was up at Hoshite Woods Forest Preserve off of Route 25 in St. Charles. It's a neat place. If you, uh, if you haven't been up there, you should check it out. Um, there's some wet fields up there that are excellent habitat for both woodcocks and for snipe. And um, th these birds, they're, they're um, extreme, uh, extremely well camouflaged when they're in a, uh, a marshy area that has maybe some, some duff that's built up. They blend right in and they, they rely on that camouflage for protection. So when you're walking along, you can sometimes almost step on one before it opts to take off. Um, that's what happened to me with the snipe last year. Um, I had stepped just a little bit off trail. I was actually looking uh, in a little uh, ephemeral pond to see if I could find the chorus frog that I was hearing. And um, this, this snipe exploded and, and flew away. First, I thought it was a woodcock, but I could see considerable amounts of white on its wings. So I uh, found out that I had seen my first snipe. Now, some of you might be more familiar with snipes from having been told to go on a snipe hunt. Um, that was a thing I know my, my dad used to talk about sending his, his buddies when he was a kid off on snipe hunts, uh, thinking that the big joke was that there's no such thing as a snipe. Well, actually, there is. <laughs> um, so this is the, um, 
the American woodcocks range in uh, they're in the eastern part of North America, almost right down the middle of the country. You can divide uh, between woodcock and non-woodcock habitat. <laughs> um, the uh, the orangish pinkish color is where they are in the uh, summer for their breeding territory, and then the blue parts are um, where they migrate to in the winter. That purple area is can be found uh, the year round. And again, you'll see they, they even though they're a shorebird, much of that uh, area that they inhabit is not anywhere near um, actual open water. But uh, again, they do favor those wet areas. They've got some really fabulous names. I first heard them referred to as timber doodles. Um, and then I found out that a timber doodle was the same as a woodcock. Uh, bog suckers, Holcomb pokes, Labrador twisters, all kinds of fun names uh, associated with these birds. And I tell you, they have adaptations that are just truly phenomenal. Um, I mentioned their camouflage. This was a photo that was sent to me a couple of uh, summers ago. This is actually a woodcock um, uh, chick, or I think they're called chicks, a baby. It's, it's not very old. It is um, hoping uh, that it is not going to be discovered there on the side of the path. This was, I believe, over at Primrose Farm. Again, the, the woman who spotted this almost stepped on this bird, um, actually almost stepped on its uh, nestmate. There, there was another picture that she sent where there was a bird fluttering off, uh, scared the life out of her, she said. And then this one was sitting by the side of the trail. She wanted to know what these birds are. Um, they, um, they have quite a, a, a history. People have been fascinated by them. This is John James Audubon's uh, depiction of woodcocks. Um, and you'll notice that he has one uh, probing the soil. That is how they find their food. That is the main purpose for that long bill, uh, which measures it um, longer than your pinky finger, unless you've got really long fingers. <laughs> um, I would say it's close to four inches long. It um, is made for plumbing the depths of the soil, looking for earthworms and other types of invertebrates. Um, it's got a lot of nerves that are concentrated at the lower third of the bill. They're so sensitive, they, not only can they sense that uh, there's a worm or a, a other invertebrate nearby underneath the soil, uh, but they can also uh, sense the mucus trail that those, those worms leave behind. So, Again, you, you can't ask for a, a, a better adaptation for hunting for something that lives below the, uh, the soils, the topsoil. Um, you'll notice that uh, there had to be a, a couple of sacrifices made in terms of where um, parts go on the, the bird's head. Look at where the eye is. Uh, it's way up uh, high and towards the back uh, of the head. Um, this bird actually can't even see the end of its bill. So again, that sense of touch that it has um, at, the, at the end of the bill is very, uh, very important because it's, it's basically probing blindly. I remember I was up at Otter Creek Bend several years ago and I saw all these holes in the mud uh, along the bank of the creek there. And I thought, what kind of a creature, uh, creature, uh, erupts in a big group like that and, and doesn't leave any soil particles as they come up out of the ground. It seemed like it was such a clean exit. And lo and behold, I, I got to thinking about it. I thought, well, of course it was a, a woodcock that wasn't, nothing was going, uh, coming up out of the ground except um, the bird's beak as it was pulling uh, worms or, or other things that it found in that wet soil. Um, so because they rely heavily on uh, earthworms for their um, their diet, they do this little thing where they, they kind of stomp their feet. And a couple of uh, papers that I read likened their uh, creating vibrations in the soil to uh, this practice of drumming for worms. I don't know if you've ever seen these guys. It's really interesting. You take a, a car stick and you rub another stick against it and it creates vibrations in the soil that actually cause worms to uh, rise up towards the surface. It's also called uh, grunting for worms or worm grunting. Um, it's a it's kind of an obscure pursuit. You don't find a lot of worm grunters, at least not in this area, um, unless you're around uh, American woodpecks. So they 
um, have these uh, yet another adaptation for uh, finding their uh, their prey of choice, the earthworm, by creating vibrations uh, at the the, uh, the top of the soil. Um, then they've got pretty phenomenal hearing, but their ears are in a sort of unusual spot. They're actually below the eye. Because of the position of the eye and the skull, um, their whole brain has kind of shifted backwards. And the eye is down uh, in this area. We had a uh, preserved, um, not taxidermied uh, woodcock, but a frozen woodcock that I was able to probe around and actually find where that uh, that ear hole was, and it is right below this giant eye, which, by the way, this the vision that um, woodcocks have is, is pretty acute as well. They can see um, 180 degrees around their body. Um, do I have that right? 180, 360? They, they, they have a really wide range of vision um, looking at both sides of their head. Uh, they can see if you if you approach from behind if you're over that's um, they wait and they wait and they wait but they know you're there uh, and they uh, explode at the last second and, and fly away but the eyes they actually uh, kind of protrude from the head uh, to add to the uh, field of vision that they have um, the the hearing there's some debate as to whether they can actually hear worms underneath the ground uh, or if that uh, the hearing is is really just um, there so that they can hear predators coming. Anyway, their, their hearing is pretty, pretty good, but it's done from ears that are below their eyes. Now, um, Aldo Leopold, he kind of made uh, the woodcock famous in his Sand County Almanac, writing about what he called the sky dance. Um, and he, I, I won't uh, read the chapter, if you have this book, it, this is the time of year that you want to reference, not the month of March, but actually in uh, the month of April in uh, Aldo's Almanac. Uh, he was a little bit farther north. Um, this book was written, I believe that was written in the 1930s or 40s. So um, there's also been a little bit of shift in uh, our temperature and climate and, and natural events. So um, what he was seeing in April and May, we tend to see here in March and April. Uh, but he talked about how once he discovered it, he didn't want to miss a single performance. The male woodcock um, does an amazing uh, courtship display where he, first of all, he starts out on the ground uh, doing a little bit of a, a, a waggle dance. Um, uh, bouncing back and forth and uh, getting the, uh, he flares his, his tail feathers too, which have some, some white bands on them. Uh, he does this at dusk and after. So it's important uh, that uh, I think some of those feathers are lighter like that because it, it helps the females to be able to see him even on a night when the moon isn't so bright. Uh, but he starts to display on the ground. Um, they make a sound that's very much like that of a uh, common nighthawk. Uh, which of course those haven't returned yet. Those are insectivores. We'll be seeing those uh, probably in a, another couple of months. But um, whereas you hear the nighthawk up in the sky, the woodcock is calling from the ground and it's a, um, sounds kind of like this. Uh, it's called painting and um, they're spaced about two seconds apart. Um, it's kind of his, his alert, his, his uh, call to attention. Um, after he thinks he might have some females have their eye on him, then he takes off and he flies up in the sky up to about 200 feet. And then he slowly circles downward, making a, a kind of a whistling sound. Uh, Aldo Leopold, he describes this uh, in, in wonderful detail in his book. Um, and uh, he, he does, wonders, uh, after he describes the dance, he wonders what makes the twittering sound that accompanies that downward spiral of, uh, of the Woodcock sky dance. Well, um, we've since learned that um, it's not a vocalization, it's actually the uh, outer uh, wings, the first uh, primary, uh, wing primaries, 
or make this um, whistling sound. If you've ever heard a, a morning dove take off, you know, they're, they've got a, a lot of whistling in their wings too. It's, it's similar to that. Um, and as, as the bird comes down, you hear the um, whistle, whistle, whistle as it comes down uh, to the ground. Um, then he starts and then he'll start his painting all over again and the display takes over. Uh, once again, um, he does this for, for a few hours in the, uh, the evening into the night. And then uh, sometimes there is a repeat performance uh, the next morning. So if you're a night person, you can go out and see him at dusk. And if you're a morning person, sometimes you can catch those repeat performances um, at daybreak. And this is what it's all about. Uh, this is a, a family of woodcocks. Uh, this was a um, a yard over in uh, Elburn near Johnson's Mount. It's actually uh, adjoining the Hughes Creek Golf Course. Uh, this was a, a couple who had planted their yard in uh, natives several years ago. Um, they've got a kind of a, a moist band in their yard and they so they had a lot of uh, moisture loving marshy types of plants i.e. Uh, good woodcock habitat. However, when they first planted it and for the first several years that they had it, they were following the instructions of the, uh, the uh, contractor who had installed that planting for them. They said to burn it every year. Well, burning every year is a pretty um, uh, aggressive approach, a pretty uh, labor intensive approach to using fire to manage uh, a natural area. Usually uh, a regimen of about every three years is what's more recommended. So uh, these folks, they um, thought, you know, you know this, this burning is getting to be an awful lot of work. Maybe we'll just let it go for a little while. And look at what the result was. They had a, enough duff buildup that it was attractive to a family of woodcocks. Um, Mama hatched these four. Um, this was uh, a year ago that this occurred. They're actually uh, keeping an eye and an ear out hope, um, open again this year, hoping that the family returns. And maybe maybe these babies even will be coming back to do their own displays and their own renditions of the sky dance. So anyway, you can, you can see these guys at uh, several parks and preserves around here. Uh, they're at Fearson Creek Fen. Uh, they're at uh, the Hickory Knolls Natural Area. We actually have them in a couple of different places at Hickory. One is um, right behind the, the building. If, after you cross the Boys Home Road, of Hickory Knolls, you enter uh, the natural area. There's there's a, a wet spot on the um, kind of the, it would be to your right as you're heading west on the, the northern part um, of that that uh, natural area. Um, so you can, if it's a chilly night, you can almost uh, see and hear them from your car if you park um, near the, uh, the picnic shelter. The other area would be a little bit further back. Um, you could hike in and um, use your ears. I know last year I was the, the last program I did before um, the quarantine hit was a, a scout overnight. And it was, I, I believe the date was March 8th. So almost exactly a year ago, we were out hiking um, at dusk and after dark and um, the girls got to witness the sky dance too, which was pretty exciting for them. So anyway, this is uh, one of uh, many, many springtime happenings that are going on right now in our parks. Um, there's also a debate, is it wabbit season? Is it duck season? Is it duck season? Is it wabbit season? Well, actually it's squirrel season. Um, they are building their nests now and Bob and Kithy Andrini, I wanna thank you for this photo. This is a squirrel collecting nesting materials, no doubt in um, preparation for her coming family. Um, squirrels mate in January and February in this area, and they have a gestation period of about 44 days. So if we do some math, um, we should be seeing um, the, well, we, hopefully we won't be seeing the baby squirrels so they're big enough to leave the nest. They, they should be being born now as we get um, through to, to uh, later March and into April. It uh, takes another month or so for them to, to get their fur. Um, and uh, then as we get into uh, later April and into May, then they start making tentative ventures away from uh, their nests. But this was some squirrel mischief uh, that Bob and Kathy caught in their backyard. And if we look closely, I love this tree that this mischief is occurring in. Um, I don't know if you recognize it or not. Uh, 
I'll give you a couple of hints here. Well, actually, I guess I'll give you the name. I thought I had an animation there that was going to pop up. Yeah, that's a tulip tree. Um, tulip trees, sometimes they're called tulip poplars, but they're actually not uh, members of the poplar family. They're, they're in the magnolia family. Um, what we're looking at here on the left is the seeds. Um, and what we're looking at on the right is the shape of the leaf, which you can see how it was given the name tulip tree. Um, it gets these really cool blossoms too that then form those seeds. But um, it's, it's a really neat tree. There's a few of them around town here. I know I'm always excited when uh, I see a, a tulip tree leaf on the ground. When I, I worked at uh, Red Oak Nature Center, we had one too, just one tulip tree in the uh, the 40 acres of that preserve. And it's uh, it's not too far from the bike trail, um, a little bit north of the entrance to the Red Oak um, proper, um, where, where you come in off of the uh, the parking lot. But they're, they're not terribly common around here. They are a, a really neat tree though. Uh, and one that's uh, easily identifiable, if you can get a glimpse of the seed heads or time these flowers, uh-oh. Oh, golly, let's hope that that doesn't bode. <laughs> All right, it went away, that's good. Um, <laughs> um, they're, they're just, a, they're a cool tree. Uh, they're fast growing too. So if you're looking for something to add to your yard, um, I, I highly recommend uh, looking into the tulip tree. And since we're talking about tree identification, I, I saw this tree, um, this was at Fabian Forest Preserve. I was walking around and they've been doing, uh, there's pockets there that have undergone uh, some, some restoration. There's parts that are, are looking very, very nice. They've gotten rid of the invasive honeysuckle and buckthorn. And um, I, I was walking along, I, I wasn't, you know, really concentrating so much on restoration, but this tree caught my eye and I thought, oh my goodness, it's it's being trapped by honeysuckle. And then I looked again and I thought, no, that's not honeysuckle. That's actually part of that tree. Um, this is a type of tree that's, that's kind of famous for its suckers. Um, suckering being the, the name for the growth habit that we're seeing here. Um, this is, suckering is, is pretty typical for this type of tree. Uh, I've never seen one that's had such a profusion of, of small suckers like this. It almost made me wonder if maybe the tree had a little problem further up, but most of these suckers are the same size. Uh, you know, something, um, I didn't see any damage farther up on the tree, but um, when, a, when a, uh, a, this particular type of tree though, um, does sucker quite readily. Its buds at this time of year are red. Um, looking at trees, you know, I think we all as kids uh, were taught to identify trees by their leaf shape, um, but looking at the bark and the growth habit of whether the branches are uh, growing opposite from each other or alternately from each other, those are all clues that we can use to help identify the tree. Well, the suckering growth habit combined with the red buds um, in late winter um, tells us that this is American basswood. Um, you might also know this tree from its heart-shaped leaves and the wonderful scent that the uh, blossoms give off in June. Um, if you're a, a local honey fancier, I know uh, some of our beekeepers in this area try to uh, position some of their hives near basswood trees because it um, basswood flowers make for a, a super uh, sweet, uh, super floral smelling type of honey. Anyway, um, if you're out and about and you see uh, a tree with some suckers around it, um, <laughs> suckering um, meaning the growth habit, not the people, uh, know that you're looking at an American basswood. Now, I also noticed um, this was on a couple other trees that we have some bare vines right now, and it's always good to know your vines. Um, we have a plant in this area called poison ivy, and uh, if you've had it before, you, you probably never want to have it again. Uh, the reaction that 
occurs in about two out of three people. There, there are those occasional people who are not allergic to poison ivy, um, but they, the reaction is produced by an oil, urushio oil that's in the vine itself. That doesn't go away when the leaves do. That's in the vine, that's in these little rootlets. Um, if you're the sort of person that likes to take a break by leaning up against a tree, you want to make sure that you're not going to lean up against poison ivy because you can actually, if your skin touches that um, that vine, even in the winter, you, you could very well get the rash. Well, um, the, those uh, hairy, very thin like rootlets are uh, a signature hallmark of the um, the poison ivy vine. But over here on the right, we have um, another vine that kind of looks superficially like that. But when you look closer at those rootlets, you see that they're wider and they're flatter. Um, this is actually Virginia creeper. Um, you might know both of these plants. They, they tend to grow together in a lot of places. Here's an example. We've got um, the leaves of three, let it be, of poison ivy here right in the middle. And then we've got the one, two, three, four, five leaves of the Virginia creeper coming in uh, along the side here. We've got some grapevine and some other things going on here too. But um, that's what makes this plant so tricky. The poison ivy, you might look um, at a group of plants or a group of vines and you might think, oh, it's just, you know, one or the other, but, but poison ivy can sneak in pretty much anywhere. Um, and you, you always want to look before you lean because you do not want to uh, bump up against uh, a poison ivy vine when you're out and about. Um, seems like we've got a lot of poison ivy uh, in our woods. Um, it is spread by, through seeds, and those seeds are consumed inside berries that a lot of our birds eat. Um, seems that humans are the only animals that have a reaction to this plant. So the, the birds will feed on those berries pretty readily, and, um, and they, they spread the, the vine around. It is a native plant. Um, I know here at the Park District, our policy is to um, keep it away from public areas, but we do let it grow in uh, certain other parts that we know uh, public isn't, uh, isn't or, or shouldn't be uh, visiting. So anyway, keep an eye out when you're, uh, when you're out and about, look out for uh, those vines. Now, here's an email I got uh, just the other day. This fellow is a kind of a regular correspondent. We check in with each other a few times a year. Uh, he said that he was out bike riding and um, he described a pond just east of Randall Road, uh, south of uh, Red Haw. Um, so this would be the, uh, the west side of St. Charles, but just east of Randall. Um, he rode into the park and discovered uh, hundreds of dead fish floating on the surface of the pond in this park. Um, his guess was that the fish were killed by the pond being too shallow and uh, that the cold was too much for them. That's a pretty accurate guess, as we'll see. Um, he wanted to know uh, what was going on. And again, he was fortunate that, I uh, feels fortunate that he's got so many places to visit. So anyway, um, I went over to check this out. Uh, what he was talking about is Timber Trails Park. Um, this is a park, so I've, I've lived in, 20, uh, in um, St. Charles here since, 1993. It wasn't until I started here at the Park District in 2007 that I even found out we had this park. It is hidden. Um, if you live in the uh, the Timber subdivision or you know somebody who, who does, uh, there is another entrance um, with a playground. So some people know it from that side. But over here on the west side, uh, Timber Trails Park is uh, kind of hidden. The entrance, uh, you have to wind through this um, industrial park, uh, Sportsplex is over here, um, uh, Riverlands Brewing is over here. But anyway, you, you come in, um, Comet Motorsports, that's where I take my motorcycle <laughs> to get uh, tuned up. Anyway, you, you come through uh, the industrial park and you end up here in, in Timber Trails. Here's the pond uh, that uh, Cottonwood Kid was uh, referring to. Um, it's got, the, there's some um, townhomes over here on this northwest side, and there's a, a little um, fishing pier 
here as you walk uh, up to the park, uh, the park pond. Uh, so I, I looked from this perspective and I, I honestly, I was expecting to see just fish bodies floating all over the place. We do have that happen occasionally. Um, a fish kill, a winter fish kill happens. Uh, there's a couple of different things that can go on. One, if, if the pond is very shallow, if there's a lot of silt, so there's not a lot of water, when you get some extreme cold, it can freeze solid and that will kill pretty much um, all the vertebrates that are, are in the pond. They'll get trapped in the ice and, and that doesn't bode well for them. Uh, another thing that can happen is uh, you can get a, a coating of ice uh, that doesn't freeze the entire pond solid, but uh, when that ice then gets covered up with deep snow, it blocks the light that the plants need uh, they stop photosynthesizing and they start to die, that decomposition will eat up the oxygen and fish will die that way as well. Um, I can't say for certain what happened here at Timber Trails um, other than that I was really surprised at the kind of fish that died. Um, here's one look. Uh, this is what you can see from the edge of the the, uh, the fishing pier there. Here's a closer look. Look, um, if you will, at the, the shape of these fish and the color of these fish. Now, some of them have kind of, they've been you know, sitting there, floating there for a while. They're, they're bloated, they're, they're getting pale, um, they're, they're decomposing. But um, I found it, these are all goldfish. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, for one, I, I uh, have looked into this pond uh, when we've had field trips here. We look into the water and um, we'll see, a lot of times we'll see turtles and frogs in there. The fish that I've seen have always looked uh, like sunfish. So I'm pretty sure we've got some native fish in this pond. Um, I did not see anything that looked like a sunfish, uh, like a bullhead, uh, like any of the, um, the hardier um, native game species that I would expect to see in a pond like this. Uh, I checked with uh, Brian Solomon, who's our uh, one of our restoration ecologists, who's also a, a fish guy. And he thought that um, probably what happened was that uh, goldfish are less tolerant of, of cold temperatures and um, that the, the native fish were able to tolerate the cold while the goldfish were not. Uh, he might uh, go and check this out as well. And if you're into, you know, interesting natural phenomenon like this, this is kind of a limited time engagement. You, you don't want to get too close to these fish as the decomposition progresses. Um, I would say though that the, uh, the snapping turtles that live in this pond um, are probably having a feast on these guys right now. Um, uh, they were to the point where they were so thoroughly decomposed that they wouldn't uh, be good nutrition. So I would imagine that the, the turtles are, are going to clean this up fairly quickly. And then the other decomposers can have what's left. But anyway, um, timber trails apparently used to have uh, a last up till through this, uh, till we got to winter anyway, had a pretty, pretty big population of goldfish. And now I'm guessing that the population of goldfish in that pond is next to zero. Anyway, um, when we're looking at uh, water around here, uh, you might remember this kit that I mentioned um, a few weeks ago. This uh, is something you can get from the Isaac Walton League. Uh, if you go to their website, uh, they have a, a chloride monitoring program, uh, Winter Salt Watch. Um, this, you can get these uh, test tabs sent to you and you go out, you collect some water, and you see what's going on uh, in the surface water in your, uh, your town, your neighborhood, your backyard, wherever it might be. Um, you uh, look at the, where the yellow uh, comes up on this test tab. Um, this was a sample that I took at the Fox River near uh, Mount St. Mary's Park. And it gives us a reading of um, 4.0 quantab units, which comes out to 172 parts per minute, uh, parts per minute, parts per million. So um, I 
looked around online and then I talked to a friend of mine who's an aquatic ecologist to find out what does 172 parts per million mean? Well, um, anything from one to 100 parts per million can be considered normal depending on uh, what the, the bedrock and the, the kind of the geology of that area is. There's a lot of rocks that have uh, salty uh, chloride uh, mineral contents that will add to the chloride content of the water. Uh, at 250 parts per million, uh, water starts to taste salty. Uh, here in Illinois, the Illinois EPA um, range uh, goes up to 500 parts per million. So actually 172 isn't all that bad. But uh, what my friend, the ecologist told me was that um, this salt doesn't really go anywhere. Right now it's very dilute because our, um, uh, the, the snow are melting, we're in springtime, so we're going to be getting more rain. But as we get into summer, we tend to see uh, chloride levels rise. And so it, it's a little counterintuitive because right now or, or coming off of winter, that's when all the salt that was put down on the road is uh, washing into our waterways, but it sort of remains. So I, I wanna go out again uh, in the summertime to see, I wanna go to that same spot and do another test and see. So this is kind of a, a stay tuned type of thing. I wanna see if we are, are still around 172, uh, if it goes up or if it goes down as we get into summertime and water levels start to drop. Uh, besides that road salt, um, our older styles of water softeners uh, put a fair amount of, of salt back into um, our local waterways. Um, septic fields, this was kind of an interesting read. I was reading about how um, with Americans eating a lot of uh, prepared foods that have higher salt contents, their uh, urine contains higher amounts of salt. And in septic fields, uh, that salt is not removed in the, the leach fields. It, it just kind of percolates around and it can enter into groundwater that way. Um, some of the consequences of increased chloride levels include a higher incidence of invasive plants like uh, Eurasian water milfoil. It can tolerate pretty high chloride levels. A lot of our native aquatic plants cannot. So uh, I know in certain pockets around here, we're seeing just tons of this milfoil and it forms just thick mats. Um, and maybe that's because it's it not only has it been introduced, but it's also able to outcompete because it can withstand the, the higher chloride levels. Uh, amphibians, of course, are they're sensitive to so many things, uh, including higher chlorine levels. And then there's certain fish, not so much the, the fish uh, that we have around here, but uh, like uh, brook trout and uh, rainbow trout, they are very sensitive to chloride levels too. So uh, this is a, a problem that's uh, pretty much nationwide, anywhere that salt is being used as a, a de-icing agent. Uh, you know, St. Charles has been pretty proactive and looking at alternatives um, and trying to reduce the total amount of, of chlorides uh, in the materials that they're using to uh, de-ice our roads or keep our roads safe. So um, maybe that's having an effect. And maybe uh, when we measure again in the summer, we'll find that um, our chloride levels are, are okay here in the, the mighty Fox River. Meanwhile, down the road in Geneva, if you've walked around um, Peck Farm or uh, across the road at uh, the walking trails by the uh, Stephen Persinger Center, you'll notice that these, these rock cages went up, um, gosh, getting close to a year ago now. I remember I, I saw uh, on the Geneva Facebook page, someone was wondering what these were, and there were just some some great responses. Somebody said that uh, the Flintstones were uh, moving to Geneva. Uh, somebody said it was a uh, um, need a rock, take a rock um, type of thing, or, or you know, donate rocks and, and take rocks. Um, it turns out that these are um, rather innovatively designed uh, holders for interpretive signs that are yet to come. Uh, there's also uh, a Stonehenge-like structure there, and I know some of us have been wondering just what the heck that thing is. So I, I asked uh, Christine Shields, she's the new manager over at Peck Farm, and she said that um, we actually were, were pretty right on with our guess of Stonehenge. That is a Stonehenge structure, and I'm going to see here if I can find 
her response. Um, it's a summer solstice monument. Um, now, Christine has only been the manager at, uh, at Peck Farm since uh, August of this past year. So a lot of this, um, this planning for these interpretive signs and such were done before she came on board. Uh, she said, I wish I could say there was a reason for it, but I think they just like the concept. Um, they are actually going to be doing uh, a sunrise program on uh, some, uh, June 20th, summer solstice. They're going to see uh, if it works. Uh, it was installed four degrees off, so we'll see is what her response was. So anyway, there might be some kind of cool solstice uh, type of event that's going to occur in Geneva, but only time will tell on that. I asked her about the materials that that, so, uh, that Stonehead structure was made from. I thought, well, maybe it was leftovers from a, a barn or, or some other relic from the Peck family, and she said no. Um, that it was, it's just some uh, basalt uh, that they imported for, um, let's see, what does she say? Um, yeah, basalt rock brought in from Canada. Um, so anyway, I thought that was uh, kind of uh, some, some good backstory for um, this, if you've walked in Geneva, if you haven't walked in Geneva, you might want to go check it out because it is it is an impressive structure. Uh, and then there was kind of a, another funny little thing. They are um, adding a lot of interpretive signs uh, around the park there. And this is one that they'd asked us to proofread um, because there's a, you can see there's a lot of elements here. Uh, this is going to be installed near the pond that's by the Persinger Center in Geneva. And, um, they're talking about uh, the fish life there, the bluegill, the bullhead, um, the amphibians there, like green frogs, um, dragonflies. Well, there were a couple of uh, invertebrates that were pictured here that um, weren't really to be expected in a pond sort of habitat. Um, and as we were proofreading, uh, we made some suggestions about um, things that might Maybe they could switch out some photos. Well, some of these photos are, are kind of hard to find and some of these photos are also kind of expensive. So when, when we made the suggestion of um, switching out uh, the Helgramite, which is um, a, an invertebrate, um, but also called toe biters, they are the, um, the larval form of the Dobson fly. And they, they pretty much only live in well oxygenated streams. And we said, maybe, you know, Helger mites should be taken off of this sign. And maybe you could put in something like a water scavenger beetle. Um, they said, great, do you have a picture? And I scratched my head and I said, you know what? I think I do. Um, and I, I went digging around and sure enough, um, I had found these in a, um, an abandoned pedal boat in Geneva. I had gone down there. I forget what I was looking for, um, but this was a, a pond in a subdivision. And I saw, I found all these water scavenger beetles. These are really, really cool uh, little insects. Look at the antennae there. Um, they are different from the um, predaceous diving beetle. They've got, um, predaceous diving beetles are, are they eat other insects. The water scavenger beetle is more um, uh, herbaceous or, um, uh, well, it's a scavenger, as you can tell by its name. But anyway, look at these, uh, look at these antennae and um, the way these long legs on the side are adapted to, to function like oars on a boat. Um, these are not, by the way, these are not the whirligig beetles that spin around, um, but you will find uh, water scavenger beetles usually in, in um, you know, groups of you know, maybe a dozen or so um, skittering around on the water surface and um, feeding on the um, uh, you know, bits of aquatic plants and other things that, that float to the surface. So, so I sent this over uh, to uh, the folks over at Geneva and said, you know, here, here you go, you can have it. And I was actually kind of excited because I thought, wow, my hand is gonna be on an interpretive sign. Well, it's not. Um, <laughs> this is the final version. They cropped it out. Um, I did get a photo credit somewhere. Um, 
but uh, if, if you happen to be over at the person your center, I think this sign is going to be installed sometime now in the next maybe month to six weeks, whenever the weather um, is going to be nice and warm and dry for a period of time, these signs will be uh, installed and you can go check them out and learn all about the life in the wetland area uh, surrounding the Persinger Center. Um, so, um, <laughs> well, I was not able to join you guys yesterday. I know you were talking about a lot of different things um, that are coming up in uh, your gardens and that you've seen on your walks. Um, and I said when I finally was able to join you that I would mention th these programs that we've got coming up here in the nature department at St. Charles. Uh, this spring ephemerals project is something um, the date says March 1st to April 30th. That's, that's pretty loose. Um, you know, it's, this isn't a program that you need to attend. This is a, a form of citizen science where we're asking people to go out and uh, take pictures of what they see uh, in the way of uh, plants that are growing. It doesn't have to be in a park. Uh, we just ask that it's somewhere within um, St. Charles, the city of St. Charles. Um, and we just kind of want to get a handle on the diversity of the plants that uh, we have in this area. And we're running this project through uh, iNaturalist, which has a website as well as an app that you can put on your phone. I've got to say, I'm not an iNaturalist expert. Um, I'm just kind of getting to know it myself. But uh, if you go, I, I did this from their website because that's where, where I'm most comfortable operating from. If you go to their main page, which is iNaturalist.org, you click on uh, community here, you get a drop down menu and you can see the second item there is projects. Uh, when you click on that, uh, you come to uh, their project page. And this was kind of cool. This box here is a rotating series of photos. Um, I love Project Porchlight. That says bathrobes are the new lab coats. Those of you who know me well know that I love a good bathrobe. Um, but anyway, um, you can then go down here to the search and you type in the name of uh, this project, which is St. Charles, Illinois, Spring 2021 Ephemerals. You click go and that brings you to this project page. Uh, you click on the, the blue hyperlink there and that takes you to uh, the main page. We've had um, four observations so far, uh, three skunk cabbage and one pack of Sandra. Uh, I'd love to uh, invite you all to, to participate in this and spread the word too. We'd like to have as many um, sightings uh, listed as possible. This picture here at the top, this is uh, some hepatica that was, uh, that was a picture from last year. So there's, there's lots of um, rewards to be found if you can get out and start looking for these uh, different spring ephemerals um, or uh, anything else you might see blooming. We've got uh, the blue scylla, the, uh, the, the non-native um, uh, blue flowers that come up. They naturalize in a lot of lawns around here. I saw a couple of friends already have snowdrops blooming. There's some buttercups that are peeking up. Um, so this is, we're, we're really on the cusp of this, this warm weather that we've had this week has really sent a lot of things popping up through the soil. So we'd love to get some participation in this project. So go ahead, check it out, spread the word. Uh, the more observations we can get, the better. Um, and this also kind of folds into the, this other project that we're doing. Um, the City Nature Challenge is, I think I started to explain it last night. But um, it started out in California and it spread around the world. And this year, uh, St. Charles is going to enter as well. It's, it's really, it's, it's a contest um, to see how many nature observations a community can provide within that uh, four day period, April 30th to May 3rd. And um, it's really anything that's um, part of the natural community plants, trees, fungi, bugs, birds, uh, reptiles, there are reptiles and our amphibians. Um, that's funny, I think they made a typo here. <laughs> reptiles and animals. <laughs> um, I'll have to talk to our marketing department about that, um, see if they can get that changed. But anyway, um, we have another project on iNaturalist. Um, 
where you enter your observations. At the end of those four days, we tally those up and we see where St. Charles ranks in terms of the um, amount of, of um, nature that has been observed. So um, anyway, check that out as well. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm new to iNaturalist. Um, I've always kind of, you know, I, I looked at it as, as competition to the, the field guides that I've just grown to love over these years. I, I like the feel of a book in my hand, um, but a lot of people use iNaturalist for help in identifying things. And I'm, I'm starting to get that it, it maybe it's, it's okay. It's change is a good thing, right? <laughs> anyway, um, I'll bring you more information on these um, projects as, uh, as they develop. So anyway, invite you to participate in both of those. Now, um, next week, um, we're going to look at the science behind syrup. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that I tapped a, a maple tree in my yard. We're going to look at why it is that we do that sort of thing, and we only do it in the springtime. Um, come across a couple of areas, um, not so much here in St. Charles, but uh, three different areas close by that have some very interesting relationships uh, between the resident bald eagles and the resident great blue heron. So we're going to explore that a little bit deeper. Uh, the beavers have been very busy. They, um, they are not an animal that hibernates, so they, they've been um, around all winter, but now that the snow and the ice is gone, they can um, swim, which is what they're best adapted to, and they are um, doing what beavers do best. So we'll give a little update on that. Got some fun reader emails and you just never know what's going to happen in uh, the coming week in our wonderful natural world. So I uh, hope to see you all then. I'm going to stop the share right now and um, see if anybody has any questions or observations. Um, anything that you'd like to have for the group? Wallace. Um, has, Wallace has a neighbor Oh, we've got all kinds of chats here. Okay, um, well, I'll start at the top here um, at my Ohio workplace. We went to a local park for a winter picnic during lunch. They gathered some sticks and made a fire. Two of the persons ended up in the hospital because of the inhalation of poison ivy. Yes, that can be very dangerous. So that's a great point as we get into spring and you're cleaning your yard up. Um, uh, that, uh, and we, we, I've heard of this happening too um, during uh, restoration work days. If you throw poison ivy onto a fire, um, that oil can become airborne. So, um, and you breathe it in and it can cause all kinds of problems in your respiratory tract. Um, um, okay, so, and Chris saw at Orchard Valley, um, it sounds like maybe the carp at our Orchard Valley, if, the, if it was really big fish, Chris, um, does it have to be cleaned up? That's kind of a call. Um, uh, the, the golf course manager will probably make that decision. Um, there are a lot of things that are going to help clean that up. Um, turkey vultures aren't back yet, but like I said, turtles feast on those kinds of things until they get really bloated and stinky. Um, now, uh, in a pond, I don't, I can't quite picture the size of the ponds at Orchard Valley, but decomposition does eat up a lot of oxygen and it can foul the water up if it's a small, smallish area. I'm guessing if it's got big carp, it's probably a, a bigger area. Um, the, the course managers will probably make a call. I, I would imagine if maybe just for aesthetic purposes, I don't know if they're letting people out on the course yet, it might still be too soft, but decomposing fish can can cause quite a stink. <laughs> I would think that it would smell. And what was weird about it is they were all on the same side of the pond. Well, you know, the wind maybe blew them or? Yes, that, that's what happened um, at timber trails too, Chris. They were all on the north end. And um, when I was taking those pictures, um, there were actually little white caps on this pond because it was so windy that we've been having winds from the south. And so all the fish were clustered at the north. Um, and I think they were kind of washed over that way. I don't think they all hung out there. I think they got pushed that way. So it might have been the same case there as well. Um, but um, it is, we, we did, um, 
park district ponds, we do have some very shallow ponds that experience these fish kills too. But you know, we never run out of fish. There's always some that survive. So it, it might just be another natural mechanism that's um, meant to help level off populations. Um, Pam, uh, Mary, Mary Tivo here, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, question. Do you know what's going on? Delner Woods Park. What's going on at Delner Woods Park? There yes. was some, um, we were walking down there one day and then the next day, I, yeah, yeah. So, um, yes. The, um, tree, there was a lot of clearing and then there were all these, yeah, you know, tell me, you know what's going yeah, on? Yeah, um, it sounds like, so, and it, actually I've been been texting uh, right before, up until the program started tonight, I was texting with our uh, restoration ecologist. So they've been doing, um, the, uh, but they've been clearing a lot of brush. Delnor Woods had a tremendous amount of uh, honeysuckle, buckthorn and mulberry. And all okay. three of those um, shrubs and trees uh, were preventing the regeneration of the oaks and the hickories there. Ah. Um, and so when, when you've got a lot of, you've got a thick brush layer like that, um, once those um, bushes leave, light can't come down to the, the floor of the woods. And so acorns, they need a lot of sunlight in order to be able to, to grow and to thrive. Um, if they don't get that sun, they die out and we don't get any baby oaks. And a lot of the oaks there are getting pretty old. I know we've lost some, some big red oaks in the last few years. Um, and it's time to get the, that next generation started, but we can't do that if they, the, a, a, a healthy woodland area won't have the thick brush cover like you were seeing there. And it's um, there's been parts, if you look, if you can picture, Mary, the, the front part of Delner Woods, there's been um, uh, prior restoration there, I'd say going back maybe 10 or 15 years, and those woods are a little bit more open. Now they're trying to bring the next section up to that same standard. Looks horrible right now, I'll give you that. It looks, I was um, just looking at some pictures from Laura just a little while ago. I mean, it looks like it was clear cut. It wasn't... Um, uh -huh. Yeah, uh, it's it's done for the health of the woods, and it's the for it's one of these things where it has to look a little worse before it starts to look a lot better. But that that's what's going on there. Um, but um, actually, so so what, Laura? What you had texted about was um, there's oh, they have some. there's some burning logs there. Um, that was actually uh, sounds like some. Uh, some kids that were messing around. That was not a park district fire that was going on. So park safety is headed over there now to check it out. Um, <clears throat> and he, he's got a fire extinguisher. Okay. So hopefully he's yeah, got that out. I had seen those little pink tags on the trees. And I looked closely at them. They look like they might be small oaks, but I wasn't out. They had the pink, lots of pink tags on yes. these little small trees, and they must be the oaks they're trying to set. That's yeah. exactly okay. it. You well, know, I just was concerned. I go there a lot. Yeah. It, it, it's for the health of the health of the woods. Um, and yeah, those, those that tree tape. Yeah. Um, well, it looks that way, but I was checking it out. But, yep. That's what we need. You can be our eyes and our ears. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Well, I was keeping an eye on. That's my <laughs> park. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Sure. Um, and Miss Bonnie says that you saw tur turkey vultures in Morris yesterday, so they are on the way. So maybe, Chris, uh, we will get some vulture activity with those dead fish. I remember. Um, Gosh, this was several years ago. I was riding my bicycle um, near the Batavia VFW and, on the bike trail. And um, I saw my, my mind registered turkeys. And then I thought, yeah, oh, wait a minute, we wouldn't have turkeys like in the river like that. They run a little like gravel bar. So I circled around and I went back and it was three turkey vultures and they had this big old carp. 
and two of them were kind of pulling it open. And then the third one, they kept shooing away. I guess there was kind of a, a pecking order that had been established of who got to eat the stinky thing first. And um, so yeah, if they're in Morris, they could very well, if they were there yesterday, they could very well be here uh, today or tomorrow, especially with the strength of those winds. Um, Wallace, you might notice that uh, a neighbor is using clear plastic bags to gather sap. Um, that's supposed to be, um, I guess, a little easier, but I know some of the purists uh, have resisted that. Um, one thing, you, you don't get as much stuff falling in. Um, even if you cover your bucket, sometimes you'll end up, uh, you know, animals go up and down the trees, they put little scrapings of bark and also, um, uh, midges and other early flying insects can get into the sap and the bags are supposed to prevent that. Um, but I've also heard they're, they're kind of hard to, to rinse out. Uh, there's some, some problems with them too, but they are, um, bags are another way of, uh, of collecting the sap. Um, and then is it uh, trees that build those stick teepee structures in many of the forest preserves? Kids and also Druids. Um, one of my first experiences when I was volunteering uh, for the Forest Preserve District, uh, this was back in the late <clears throat> 90s, we were doing a, a school field trip out at Lone Grove Forest Preserve, which is out near Caneville. And um, there was one of those structures underneath this enormous oak tree. And um, we actually went inside of it because it was kind of cool. Um, it, was a, it was a warm day and it was cool and shady in there. Well, as we were going out, I noticed that the two, there were two sticks stuck in the ground outside of the, the structure. And they had all these little carvings on them. Well, we um, mentioned it to the Forest Preserve uh, police just to you know, make sure it wasn't like some kind of gang symbol or something. And they identified those as Druid carvings. And um, the thinking was that that was probably the largest oak tree in that preserve. And there was some sort of, you know, ceremonies or rituals or something that were taking place there. So it is, yeah, it is mostly, mostly kids. Um, I know occasionally there'll be people living in them, but um, then it's, they start, those teepees start to take on a more um, uh, substantial look to them. Uh, and you'll start to see, um, you know, pizza boxes and things like that too, piling up. <laughs> um, uh, Chris wanted to know, uh, where can you find uh, maple tapper? Are you talking about the little spiles, Chris, those little metal things? Um, I can get you some sources that you can order from. Um, I got to tell you that with this warm weather we've been having, that I've noticed that the tree buds are starting to swell. We'll actually flesh this out a little bit more next week, but that sap inside the tree, its job is to go up through the branches to the ends and make those buds open up into leaves. Once that starts to happen, once those buds are swelling, the sap is losing its sugar content and it's, um, the, the sugar is there to, to help the tree grow. Um, and once that's gone, the sap isn't any good anymore, but I can definitely get you some sources. In case you want to do it um, for next, next year. year. Yeah, I yeah, can do it next year. Because I sure. saw them, you drill a hole in the tree and then they put this thing in with the hook for the bucket. Yep. That would be cool. Yeah, they it, had a, um, Pam, the, the Kane County Forest Preserve had a video on that. Oh, did they make a video? Yeah, it's on the way because I went out their website because I've got a probably a hundred year old maple tree on my lot. Oh, and, nice. Um, I was thinking, but we decided I didn't know if it was, I didn't want to put a hole in the tree. <laughs> it's, you know, I don't blame you. Um, they do heal up. Um, and and there's, there's actually, there's been uh, the, the development of something they, I think they call them like health or health tappers or health spiles or something yeah. like that. Or, um, the, the old uh, measurement was always 7 16th of an inch, so almost a half an inch size hole. Uh, the health taps are, are much thinner, so the wound can heal faster. Yeah, I just decided to let it be. It's a beautiful tree. I'm just going to put a hole there in it. There you go. And you can always, you know, there's plenty of other people that'll get you your syrup, right? <laughs> yeah, I, can, I get it from Maine. From my, my sister in Maine has a farm where they tap. 
Oh, and yeah. They, they do treat, you know, they have a whole production. So I get it. That's why I was interested in. I didn't realize we could do it around here, too. So, yeah, it's one it's of like those things. A, yeah, it's it's it evokes such neat memories. Uh, we won't talk too much about it tonight, but we'll we'll uh, next week. Yeah, no, the, um, the, the Forest Preserve video was really good. I'll check it out at, okay. at King County Forest Preserves. Yes. Yeah. The gal, what's her wonderful name? Wonderful videos. They, uh, yeah, there was a video. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I'll check it out. Thanks, Mary. All right. Um, and yes, Kate, you know what? Um, I think um, I wasn't able to get your video in this week, but I, I will drop it in next week. Uh, Sandhill cranes are migrating. Um, uh, the uh, return of Sandhill right, crane couple is... We're headed out to Nelson Lake. The cranes are dancing out at Nelson Lake. All right. Yeah, Sand Hills at um, dancing at Nelson Lake. They're also uh, they've returned to um, a couple areas north of town here in St. Charles as well. And yeah, that, that um, courtship that they do is really quite something. There's a lot of um, hopping and spinning and um, spreading of wings and um, they give the woodcock some competition when it comes to uh, putting it out there for uh, the um, good of the next generation. <laughs> um, with that, um, does anybody else have anything? Mm, interesting. Interesting, interesting. All right, folks. Well, uh, we made it through. Um, Especially after nine o'clock, I told the tech guy all I need is, you know, if it can just get me through the program, at, you know, nine o'clock, the whole laptop can melt and we'll be done. And we've actually made it to almost 10 after without any incidents. So um, <laughs> I think we'll, we'll uh, leave tonight's meeting and uh, we'll look forward to um, uh, gathering next week with uh, lots more signs of spring and who knows what else will occur between now and then in our wonderful natural world. So have a great rest of your night and um, see you then. Thank you, Pam. Thank, thank, you, thank you. you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming back again, everybody. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bunch.